all across the country. And, and, that's, and that's really difficult. And we have to keep asking ourselves as to why do these crimes, these violent and brutal crimes continue to happen, particularly against young people. Um, and the political and, and state leadership continues to fail our communities. So, um, you know, police refuse to report on it, or even when victims go to report these cases, they're not investigated. Very few people um, are arrested for these crimes. And in, 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 essentially, the, the criminal justice system is failing, you know. Um, it also means that uh, uh, access to uh, basic education for, or education for queer people, access to health care continue to be challenges. And so we can't necessarily celebrate the archive without also um, engaging with uh, leadership in our, in our countries and saying, we're still continuing to fail our communities in very critical ways. Um, and in that sense, Gala does a lot of work with um, grassroots organizations, uh, particularly those who are helping <coughs> communities um, and, uh, in, in both kind of urban and rural areas. Um, and it's also about engaging various forms of communities, like uh, religious communities, where I think, um, particularly in the African context, there's still a lot of religious leaders who use their pulpits to spread hatred and fear. And there is a direct correlation between that and the violence that you know where people face. And then it's also very politically expedient or easy for um, governments and, and, and political leaders to blame gays, to blame immigrants, to blame women when they, there's a failure in, 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 um, in governance. Um, you know, it's all it's the fault of them. Yeah. Um, and we have to continuously fight against that, even as an archive where, you know, we're meant, we're not necessarily um, seen as kind of like hard activists, but we feel that it really is our role in speaking out against that. Thank you. So, Tuna, so the Queer Archive in South Africa was established in 2012. Why was Norway so late in the party? <laughs> Uh, well, of course, we didn't have, have the moment that some <laughs> yeah, uh, uh, But I think um, Norway is a very small country compared to South Africa and most other countries in the world. So um, I don't have a very good answer of why the cultural heritage sector, which is kind of full of queer people, uh, had not done anything on this. They had done, there had been one exhibition at Folkemuseet there have been tiny, tiny bits, but, but uh, very, very little. And in 2012, when we started working on this and then got funding through the 2010s, obviously for historical reasons, uh, queer history has been a taboo uh, issue uh, that has been uh, not legitimate as an academic field at all. Uh, and neither has it been a legitimate issue in the museum sector or in the archive sector. And so we know all these historical reasons why no one wanted to, to touch it because this was an embarrassing and shameful part of the national history, not something that should be uh, exposed and left it. And, and of course, a lot of people who had delivered archive material to the archives were anxious that, that this should be read as uh, as queer history. So many people would either burn their diaries, the letters, or their family would burn it. Uh, uh, uh. And also, of course, the, the Second World War also played its part. People were afraid of being identified as queers also in the archive. So many historical reasons. But why then uh, had no one kind of, of uh, uh, taken up this issue before? It, to me, it, we can discuss that, but to me, it felt a little bit like uh, Noah was very slow. Uh, uh, but then we kind of, like you said, became one of the best countries in the world for LGBT population, <laughs> uh, which is true in, in some ways. Uh, but this, in this gap between this taboo and silence phase and this uh, being one of the best countries in the world, uh, the kind of whole queer history it felt like it disappeared. So when I started talking about this, it felt like people, yeah, gay and lesbian issues, isn't that so 1990s? Aren't we done? Aren't we done with that? And so it felt like all this history that should have been developed as a part 
of the cultural history of Norway, uh, then it, it, it was so kind of passe. Uh, uh, so, so that was the kind of job they had to do. Uh, but, but now people are grasping it. So a lot of museums are interested. Okay, why haven't we done anything with this? What can we find in our collection? So now that the, the Maritime Museum in Bergen is, is developing an exhibition on where at sea, uh, the University Museum is still, so a lot of museums are developing, going through their archives and seeing what can we find in our context on queer history. And, uh, and of course, act, gay activism is a part of, of the queer history, but I think it, and especially in the Nordic countries, the queer history is so much more, uh, not only the, the activism from the 1950s and up, but, but all these queer lives, the gender transgressions, the sexual transgressions, in all the rural communities, all over the countries, in all different social classes. So all this history, I think, must be explored. And, uh, yeah. Well, you want to comment? Yes. Uh, I think, in a way, the story that we are so progressive that we tell ourselves is inhabiting, is making it difficult to actually do something about things. Uh, for example, at our events that have had best, we have a policy of not taking photos or video uh, because many people can't be taking photos since they have family and connections overseas where it will be real consequences and real danger and danger that we also find them here in Norway. And when we have, and um, me myself, when I first started in the organization, was very confused, right? What isn't it important to be seen? And, uh, and it was difficult to understand this. Uh, and when we meet media or other people at the events, it's like, yeah, but uh, we are such an open society, this shouldn't be a problem. And they just can't understand these aspects that it is still work to do both in these communities, but also in, uh, in Norway in large as well. And uh, so it's that idea, the stamp of like, we are a progressive country, it makes it kind of like, oh, we don't need to do anything. And also a, a short thing here from now, I studied field pedagogy in Oslo the last year. And we had a lovely workshop with Balansekunst about privilege and oppression with racism and homophobia and everything and how that is in art. And many of the people in the dance faculty and field faculty and in field pedagogy was like, but is this so important? Can't we just all just be and just, do we need to spend time on this? Uh, and they didn't mean it in a bad way because they it was from the idea of like we're all just equal we're all just people uh, mm -hmm. love peace and love and everything why do we need to spend time on this so it's it's still uh, here and it might be more difficult to speak about and bring focus on here than maybe other countries uh, since we have that story uh, at yeah. least there are different challenges and depending on the context. Yeah. But, uh, see if you also had a comment. Yeah, it? Yeah. Was just a short comment on what you said about the photos. Um, mm -hmm. uh, it's not that long ago it was felt we didn't take photos that they gave our uh, painting in Bergen. Mm -hmm. So yeah. And yeah. it has changed uh, yeah, mm -hmm. very much uh, like in the last years. So. And, and I think that maybe my generation that grew up of like, it's not a problem being taken photos of. Mm. It's hard to understand that not all gay people or queer people are like that. Yes, take photo of me. Uh, since I grew up in a thing where it was okay. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. <clears throat> Once again, I think the, the, the archive or the forbidden library really provides us with such insights because the archive tells us, and once again, it's like not a traditional archive, where archives aren't because it tells you about people's lives, you know, um, the, the, the personal and the deeply personal and why it's often still so difficult that even when we have progressive laws, um, people continue to hold such shame because of these histories that we and, and systems and societies that we brought in, that coming out still, even in the most progressive society, is still a huge challenge, you know, and it's why we still need to, um, in any setting, um, first prioritize the safety of people, of our community, yeah. and then everything else comes 
chunks and mixed, you know. Um, but and I think that the archive that's why it's so personal, it's, it's people's lives. You know? exactly. So I'm wondering, um, to bridge sort of the mi minorities within minorities and the archives. So if you think about the queer history going, you know, far back in your way, obviously it's um, the leaders and they are, are primarily white. But if you move into sort of a contemporary area, era, we also have to sort of uh, uh, focus in on, on uh, queer activists and queer individuals with um, uh, minority backgrounds. But how do we do that while meanwhile protecting them? Or does the Norwegian Queer Act or have, have a special focus on that? Or, um, or how, yeah. Um. How to, can you take the last no, no, uh, part of the question? No, again, when you are recording the, the queer mm -hmm. history, which is also contemporary. Mm -hmm. And, you know, if you look at history in Norway, um, we, you know, uh, there's um, uh, people coming from all over the, the world uh, as refugees and also in other capacities. So they are also part of this Norwegian history, right? Yeah. Um, so to what extent are they represented in the Norwegian queer archive? Uh, and if they are not, are there any ways we can think about um, having collaboration with the world and, and, the, and the archive in order to facilitate this? Mm -hmm. There has been some work with the um, Shalaru mm -hmm. uh, previously to try to make an archive of the material. But uh, as far as I understood, it was um, a bit uh, difficult with the uh, Organizations, the board members changed rapidly, and <laughs> and, uh, and documents and uh, things might get destroyed after uh, on board. Like they don't keep uh, records. keep records yeah. always, and especially maybe especially because of uh, if it's considered uh, sensitive material. Um, yeah, you can see. Um, we have a lot of academics and journalists reaching out to us right. and we often have to be like we can't share this and we can't share that and um, so it's a different situation for example Steve who is more like let's make a change and uh, out there because we also need to protect the members right. but yeah we are a young organization at least in Bergen which we are just five five years old but in Oslo it's been much longer so we are becoming a strong organization. But I think we can be quite pride, proud here in Bergen, because now we have this amazing employees in both Fri and Scheiwerden, uh, which are uh, queer immigrants. The Mancha in Fri, the Mancha at Scheiwerden are both amazing, uh, capable and strong queer immigrants. And the board leader uh, we have in Scheiwerden is also uh, uh, that so in Bergen it is very much represented and now but it's difficult sometimes when we have people in position in these organizations that for example can't be taken video or film of and how to let their voice be heard and their stories because it should be on their premise because I find it it's it's not okay that I'm sitting here as a um, cis white Norwegian man here representing the organization now it ended up being like that now because um but yeah yeah. <laughs> yeah but i'm sure i mean i, I worked on sudan which is um, uh, a country where it's um uh, it's, it's a quite hostile uh, political and social environment and one of the queer organizations there they um, started a project of collecting oral histories um, uh, with uh, uh, queer individuals, uh, and all of the all of the interviews are anonymous except one, which is a Norwegian a Sudanese diaspora, yes, that's Ahmad Umar, uh, known as the first gay uh, uh, Sudanese man, uh, because in that context, you know, they they cannot uh, come out with their full names. Um, but the fact that they have, you know, done this effort uh, in sort of anonymous form. Which is like the only thing out there <laughs> is is uh, tremendous and, and very, it's really important. Um, and, and you can think about something that, uh, and, similar. Yes. Um, Atuna, you want to raise your hand? <laughs> yeah. 
Yeah. No, I think that's a, that's a, a very interesting idea to, to also open up for anonymous interviews, uh, which kind of goes against the, the feeling of a historian, of course, yeah. that, that, that wants more, more um, facts, yeah. but, uh, <laughs> but, uh, but absolutely to get uh, more stories, that, that would be an opportunity. And it, Chester Keefe has done outreach work to, to try, uh, try both to get oral interviews um, from members of Shaidan and other uh, minority within minority uh, people. Uh, and also to, we have also this uh, where you can send in your queer story, which is totally anonymous. Yes. Yeah. So we've been to, to gatherings with Shaidan to, to try to get people to, to submit their stories anonymously. But it's, it's really hard. Uh, to get people to why should they why should they offer their story for what purpose and I think for all minority archives also LGBT history in general I mean it takes a lot of work to get this material uh, you have to kind of keep calling people okay you said you might have a box in your in your attic uh, <laughs> can we can you please go up and look at it so we can come and pick it up for you uh, so so the, the official archives have not been interested in queer history, maybe only Kim Freeland, the most prominent uh, uh, activists, but they would never do outreach work. Uh, and Chef Akiv does that all the time because it takes a lot of effort to get in every box, every story. Uh, most of the time you have to work really hard. And then minorities within the minor minorities double that with 10. Uh, yeah. It takes a lot of work and a lot of effort. And you also mentioned this, uh, we also uh, should remember that, that Norway's uh, uh, ethnic history is very complex. Mm -hmm. So also the national minorities in Norway, the Southern population, you have LGBT history in all these groups. So it, it's not like this is a new issue, no. it's just new groups yeah. that, that is adding to this very complex and broad uh, picture. Mm. Exactly. So I'm wondering, we are talking about this anti-gender movement, someone will call it pro ham movement. Um, do we see evidence of it in Norway as well? Mm -hmm. If so, where are they? Who are they? Obviously, we see, uh, you asked me, right? Yeah. Uh, obviously, we see examples of it. But I think also it's really important to do local research, to not kind of make this into this this idea of a transnational movement that has equal impact in all places because it doesn't and i will be very skeptical of talking about the backlash in norway for example obviously we see traces of the anti-gender movement and they're very loud but i can't see any backlash in norway and also one thing i want to mention <laughs> maybe we can get back to it I think also exploring queer history through the archives uh, in a longer uh, time span also show that it's not like uh, uh, queer history is this this long tragic line of, <laughs> of oppression. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And, uh, I mean, in the Nordic countries, none has been executed for homosexuality in Norway, even though the law said we should be until quite late. A very few got got prisoned um, uh, uh, during the, until 1972 the decriminalization decriminali in 1972. So even though the kind of expert discourses, the law, the church, and the medical profession, the med the, the the expert discourses said that this was uh, wrong or abnormal or sinful or criminal, but the people around in the small communities in Norway and the fishermen communities and the farming communities, they have different attitudes. So I think this is something we have to explore both in South Africa, different African uh, countries in Norway, that um, it's just the picture is so different uh, from today. It's not necessarily this long tragic history, but it's, it's very different. And I think it's also useful for our understandings of ourselves today to see that, okay, people can have understood themselves totally different from us. Uh, so not to kind of project our identities and categories and, and views on the world uh, down in history. Paul, you Yeah, I could listen to you for hours. <laughs> yeah. and just 
really so insightful. And I think you're right. I think um, one, uh, it, it requires a more nuanced approach to the way in which we approach history, because um, once again, we're dealing with people's lives. And also when you think about an archive, they're also, people have different ways of remembering history, the same event even. And we often find that within the, the queer archive. And, and I think that's something quite exciting. It's, it's much harder, but it also leads, I think, to a much more um, uh, uh, colorful history, um, which I think is particularly important. Um, uh, I spoke to our manager here, Bergen, today, and we don't get much direct criticism on our social media or from people here. So that's very, very nice to hear. But some, often we get these messages or comments on social media that we suspect to be bots. Uh, and there may be international bots, they have different languages. And then the question is, who pays for this? And uh, where does this come from? That are, because Shai Vandas is a very small organization. And how uh, does these bots end up targeting even us. And luckily, it's mostly board members and employees who see these comments and messages, but sometimes it could also be at the, uh, at the, a public comment uh, after a post or something. And uh, so it could also affect the members uh, there. And then it's with the video that it ends up with like these international things um, here. They, place it at uh, American conservatives, uh, not conservative, yeah, uh, uh, but we don't know uh, where does it come from and, and why is it? So that's also that it's not just local, it's also this international thing that could affect us locally. <clears throat> it's definitely global dimensions, but as well as that's definitely like it comes into play in, in very sort of, uh, it comes into play in very different ways in local contexts. Mm -hmm. Um, um, Kabbal, I, I was wondering if we could push you a little bit more to say a bit about sort of um, this, uh, what I understand has been a mobilization about this comprehensive uh, sex education in South Africa. Um, yeah, so. Yeah, so, um, uh, and I suppose, yeah, that, that really is where we see the anti gender movement mm -hmm. um, uh, having an impact in, in South Africa. Um, so, as I mentioned, we've got this robust constitution. And so the Department of Basic Education, um, we've been working with them for many, many years now in, in, in creating a curriculum that's inclusive around um, um, sexual health and reproductive health. And often when, when we say that it means about ensuring that the curriculum is one focusing on the queer history of South Africa, when we're, we're thinking more broadly about history, but it's also about empowering you, right? Empowering them to make um, to be aware of certain issues, but it's often particularly used and mobilized as like teaching children about sex, <laughs> which is you know often what the argument is. And we've noticed that um, over the particularly over the last two or three years, that in these forums where it usually is about like um, LGBTQIA plus human rights organizations engaging with, with government to say these this is how we advise you to you know make these changes. We now have a whole set of NGOs, um, often termed very nefarious or like, um, I suppose, blurry organizations like family values or like, you know, children's rights organizations. Um, and they usually start by saying they're just trying to play devil's advocate here, or they really um, are, are concerned about the rights of the children and never uh, um, ever use uh, terms that are outwardly homophobic or transphobic, but you can kind of read between the lines, you know. And they've been uh, quite successful because one, I think governments are quite fearful of the backlash. And then also, you know, schools tend to still be very uh, conservative communities. You have parents who are concerned about their children and don't want anyone to teach their children anything that they wouldn't want them to learn. And then you have teachers who, are, who continue to be quite um, conservative as well, who say, I'm not, teaching, I'm not teaching anyone's child about this. And then we know that younger people are already accessing this information um, online in any event. So it's, it's quite distractive for them because they're not get necessarily getting the right information or necessarily empowering themselves. And as a result of that, the, 
the curriculum inclusiveness tends to fall by the wayside. So we often get right up to the to the to the leadership, and then um, you know we it, it doesn't get included in in the end. They say, oh no, we're only going to get that get to it next year, for example, which I think is really destructive. And we know that it's kind of political leadership at the top that is either not supporting it or too afraid to, to, uh, to include it, even though there's a legal requirement and mandate that forces them to do it, you know? Um, and, and you see that all across, I think, the continent and where also then like religious leaders and these organizations tend to just derail the process really. Mm. And to what extent does it impact to the global issue? Do some of these uh, religious organizations and leaders have an influence to more international or global uh, uh, movements? <clears throat> Absolutely. I think they've actually been quite smart. So they've taken the NGO model that, you know, a lot of you <laughs> like um, uh, donors that, find, you know, from, the, from Europe and North America fund organizations to kind of advance human rights. They've taken the exact same model and are basically funding right-wing organizations or like church groups within these various. So they're very well-funded. Mm -hmm. They have um, very uh, effective media campaigns, um, which really are based on fear and hatred. And um, they also have um, access to power. Like they, they, they have the ear of ministers, you know, who belong to their congregations. And they use that, they wield that in like really effective ways, you know, and they never ever, as I said, the language that they, 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 they're so careful around how they think about it, that nobody can, they're like, no, we're not homophobic. Like, you know, we believe in human rights, but we just want to, to protect children, um, yeah. you know. Okay, thank you so much. Uh, I think I've uh, been, uh, had the privilege to ask many questions to the panelists, so I think I should open up for the audience, who I'm sure have many questions they want to ask. So please, also the audience online, uh, please post your question in the chat. Hold on, there is one from the audience yeah. too, so I can read it. Yes. Yeah, it says, regarding the cultural aspects, I see that, especially in some contexts, there is usually resistance, sometimes boycotts against culture slash art with queer themes. It happens even with the ones with many resources, for example, Disney's Buzz Lightyear was banned in several countries for a quick kiss. And then they ask, I wonder about the effects on smaller producers or queer artists. Would you have any comments on those cultural aspects? <clears throat> um, I worked uh, a year as a uh, uh, performing artist in Singapore. And Singapore is one of the countries who's now put a 16-year-old age limit for the Buzz Lightyear movie. Um, and often it is when these movies show them just as a positive thing, then the age limit gets higher. But if they see uh, queer characters living a tragic life, then it's more okay. <laughs> uh, so when I lived there for some years ago, uh, there were a single man didn't get the, that high of an age limit since it's quite tragic but then there was another like family comedy movie that got a higher age limit because it showed how well nice it is and by independent theater producers uh, there they could all often get censorship of like no you can't see say that as blatantly and direct so you need to use more coded language as we did here as well before um, we used more coded language here as well so yeah i've i know queer artists out there that still have to deal with that um can i i, well, I also think it is it's it is unsurprising though i mean even though it's it's really insane i mean on the one hand you're like how how um how can this one kiss be so offensive that you know you have to kind of like ban it but if we look at the way the, the kind of system structures that still exist, where even if you think about raising children and how blue is still for boys and like, you know, uh, boys must play with trucks and girls must play with dolls and that system still exists, you know? And so yeah. any challenge to the way in which we raise children globally will, will raise this kind of 
issue, you know, and we haven't really progressed that much in, in terms of, I mean, like we still have gender reveal parties, which is like an insane thing to really think about. And, and I'm not saying that, that you know, it, it was also like those light cultural issues that, that cause huge, like it can be hugely destructive, particularly for younger people who are really trying to figure out their own presence in this world. And it would be so easy to change that, right? It's like saying, well, you can play with whatever toy you want. <laughs> a child um you know and that doesn't necessarily even mean anything um and yet we still continue to to police the way in which children perform or play you know um and so i think it's really about rethinking how we change the entire system yeah um thank you for a wonderful conversation um so the the anti-gender movement is global right so um and you say that you know it's well funded it's well organized as well coordinated, um, so that we must equally be you know, well organized, well funded, um, well coordinated. Um, so I guess I guess my question for the panel then is, you know, how um, what what are we doing, and how how can we be better at you know working together globally um, as maybe academic communities, researchers, and um, career organizations. To then, um, uh, yeah, to 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 counter this movement. I think an important <laughs> question. Does anyone want to jump into answering? I, um, yeah. I'm sorry, I'm really short. I think collaboration is so important that we see that it's the same fight we are fighting, and we have to fight it together. But also that we respect that there are differences among our community, that there are both local differences, but also that double and triple minorities that we're experiencing fully different, instead of just saying, we're all just square and we haven't experienced the same thing, uh, that we need to respect the differences, but also find connection that we work together. Uh, yeah. Uh, I have no answers, but but uh, I'm just I've been thinking a lot about the situation, the history in Norway, and and this expert discourses versus public opinion. Mm -hmm. And to me, it seems like uh, uh, the law changes has kind of uh, forerun the public opinion. So uh, when uh, the decriminalization happened in 1972. Uh, and also with the partnership law in 1993, the public opinion were very much against these law changes. But then when the law changes happened, the public opinion changed really rapidly after. So, but, but I don't know if that is, I don't know what it says, but, but I think this, uh, the public opinion is so important. And especially in Norway, it feels, safe to me because the public opinion is very much on the right side but of course that could change because like you say there are really heavy organizations with major capital uh, behind this anti movement so so who knows what can happen i mean what has happened in the last few years that we never thought would happen so so who knows uh, but i think the public opinion is is important uh, and and I think in many places in the world, not only in the Nordic countries, the public opinion has not been that concerned with homosexuality. I mean, homosexual, homosexuality is a rather new issue for the, pub, the public to be concerned with. I mean, this was, not, this was not a big issue until after the Second World War, at least not in, in, uh, in the US and Europe. Uh, so this is kind of a new, we are new enemies. <laughs> <laughs> so if someone says we must, the public is not ready, we must wait for them to be ready. That's not true. We shouldn't wait. Probably not. Shavan <laughs> West brought members up to Hollingdal Pride uh, last October. And one of the events I, I was most happy with was when we sat outside one of the supermarkets there just offered like cookies and coffee and chocolate and to have a uh, queer immigrant and just queer people there and invited conversations uh, is also was a very nice thing and people that 
normally would never attend Pride or even bother watching a queer debate or something, would then like, oh sure, could you have coffee? What is this? And, and then we could ask, have you seen this flag before? And I think these small, really local things is also very nice. And one could suspect, and often it is that in these small villages that they're more racist and more homophobia, which is often true, but often it is just they've never met and spoken to a person uh, uh, of a minority or at least a double, triple minority. So to make these situations, and there were so many lovely conversations. No one came up to us and like said, no, this is not okay. <laughs> Those that came up were uh, curious and had never maybe spoken to a queer person before. Mm. Hey, Ronnie, you want to you know, I think uh, it's so much easier on the right to like all come together against a certain, you know, like your agenda. I mean, the left is so much messier. We're fighting homophobia, <laughs> transphobia, Islamophobia, xenophobia, like all of these things, and it's a messy coalition. And so, and, and that's important because often it's, we have to find commonality, I think, um, in, in solidarity, right? Um, and that means really listening. It means sometimes we're not always going to get everything that we want, but really kind of meeting us together because that's the only way I think we can really forcefully speak against a right who doesn't have those issues at all. Um, and 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 I think if, if we're able to kind of find that level of solidarity, I think we'll have a lot more success. And I'm I'm not I'm not I'm not saying it's easy. I mean obviously there's a huge disagreement around issues of faith, for example, and, and homosexuality. But there are those individuals that are able to engage with their communities in ways that we, we're not, you know, and they can really speak to a shared empathy. And I think that's where solidarity, like that's that's where we need to find solidarity, which is like not easy and it sounds like exhausting because it's like our work is never done. But yeah, we, we kind of have to just fight on, you know, there's no other choice. And to get back to the archive again, mm. I think that archive work in historical work is really important also in this political mm. context. I mean, to show, like you said, that there, queer history is not a new thing. Queers are not a new thing. It's a part of every national history. It, it has always been here in very different forms and in very different formats. Uh, but this is something that you you can find when you go back. And, and, and like, you know, we haven't really had much research on, on queer history, but I experience also that when I'm out speaking to uh, senior organizations or whatever, and and uh, talk about queer history. They, yeah, when I start thinking about it, yes, in my childhood we had one. Yeah. So they start so so just activating this, this history and that we are a part of the natural cultural histories uh, far far back uh, and that no country like we have, we see obviously in. In the situation in, in Russia today and in several African countries, many places in the world, the national history are tried uh, cleansed of queer traces. Mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. So make sure that that uh, no one is able to, to clean uh, the queer traces away, but putting queer traces in everywhere we, where we can uh, will make it much harder for the anti-gender anti movement to win, I think, because one of their <coughs> arguments is that this this new modern world is ruining everything and ruining families and blah, blah, blah. But okay, we can show that this is something that our culture has always handled in yeah. different ways. Uh, it's not a new thing. We have a question there in the back. It's, uh, I was wondering if the Queer Archive uh, has a list of missing links or uh, suggestions for topics. Uh, that, for example, students or researchers in various disciplines mm -hmm. and who want to work with queer thematics can brainstorm from and contribute to the archive. Uh, there is a list on our webpage of projects uh, that needs more research. I think maybe any of you have been, <laughs> been active in making this list, but yeah. So it's a long list, but it is more of a brainstorm list. So. So it's a long, long list, and, and there is still many, many more projects that uh, we would want someone to explore. Material is, of course, sometimes a problem. So all these ideas is not necessarily 
uh, easy to to uh, but have a look at the list. Uh, it's under research. Uh, yeah. Yeah, I have a question for Gala. Um, because you you mentioned that you know that homosexuality is often described as something kind of an African, something imported from the West uh, by you know authorities on the continent. So what's kind of the role of research then in kind of countering that narrative, and how is that kind of met by authorities, uh, the same authorities you know, perpetuating that story? Um, that's a really interesting question. Um, and on some levels, research goes under the radar, right? <laughs> Um, and, and I think uh, when, when I say that, it means that we, we also have to create a whole lot of questions and say, well, they ask all of these stories that need to be uncovered and how do we how do we do that? So like recently, for example, Carla did an oral history project in Mozambique, uncovering queer histories in Mozambique. And it's been quite, it was quite interesting in Mozambique because the decriminalization happened without much fanfare. It was like overnight the government decided decriminalization and the next day it was like, We'll move on with life. Um, and so it's still not criminal, um, criminalized. However, the state um, still uh, uh, can impose um, uh, restrictions on the right to assemble and the right to um, uh, organize um, in, into organizations. And so no LGBTQIA plus organization has, uh, has been approved as like, you know, to establish itself which essentially then poses like very severe problems on how you mobilize and, you know. Um, and so I think for us, it's about really uh, um, seeing also what works within various different localities. So for example, like I think in Mozambique, it, it means about engaging with, with governments in, in certain ways and also um, supporting activists in doing their work without necessarily also then um, raising the ear of governments, you know, so that'll make it harder for them. And that, I think the same goes um, for, for Tanzania. Um, I, I think uh, it's also then how we um, uh, particularly uh, think about visibility. So uh, we try and share stories in ways that are also quite safe. So um, last year, we also published this um, publication called Hopes and Dreams That Sound Like Yours. And that was stories of activists from all over the continent. But we knew that a lot of these activists were sharing their stories, but could still face a lot of um, uh, issues of, of safety within their respective uh, communities. And so we um, decided to engage um, artists in ways of kind of creating a visual depiction of those stories as a way of then sharing it, which I think was hugely um, amazing because also activists were like, I finally see myself in queer stories, which I've never seen before. I've seen like queer African stories and that's quite important. So I think there are different ways in which we can really challenge the ways in which um, research is done in, 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 on the continent um, and also support that. The last thing I want to say is that I think we, what we're trying to do is also focus a lot more on supporting African scholars doing research on Africa, um, you know, so that it's not always also just like scholars from, from the US or from Europe coming into and doing important work, no doubt, but, but you know, we should be, and, and, and that's often more challenging, but we need to be supportive of that. Yeah. And that's an aspect you find in Asia as well of like, this is a Western thing uh, coming. But what really is a Western thing uh, was these laws against, for example, homosexual sex, uh, sex. Just a couple of days ago, they had pink dot in Singapore which uh, is like their version of pride, but a pride parade is not allowed, it's not legal. So they said, let's have a picnic in a park, uh, create a pink dot and celebrate <laughs> and laugh, uh, which is a, they pride the way in that society. Yeah. But uh, it's penal code 377A, which it makes uh, gay sex legal and you could be jailed by, even though they say, we will never change someone, but we cannot take away because we are a conservative society, so we need this law. This is a British law. It's, it's not an uh, Asian law at all. And before the British came, it was much more open for uh, trans uh, identities and uh, sexualities. So now they say, we need this law to keep our traditions, and the law is imposed on them. It's yeah. Yeah, that was uh, the same thing I was uh, thinking about 
was um, was asking about the being uh, there is enough, but um, in no way the laws go a long time back. But uh, these laws against uh, homosexuality in uh, like South Africa, like are they new or or yeah? Um, well, from a historical point of view, we can go back all the way to like you know indigenous communities in the Khoisan. We even have words, so I think language is quite important, mm -hmm. where you know they speak about same-sex familial relationships, and part of the, uh, the the job of the archive is to uncover those um, stories. So very very similar to um, Singapore, any other I think um, kind of country within the global south where the, the criminalization was specifically something that was imported from from Europe. Um, and then I think, uh, importantly, in South Africa's context, um, it was also during apartheid that um, the system not only sought to regulate, um, you know, kind of public life, but also private life. So, um, in addition to like banning marriages between different racial groups, for example, they increased the criminalization effects of, of, of homosexuality. For example, it was during the apartheid um, time, or like the 60s, that. Um, uh, lesbian acts were criminalized for the first time. Um, and so it really sought to like invade almost every element of, of, of private life, um, which is, I suppose, also then why 1994 was such a watershed moment, because it was really this break from this culture of, of authority to one of justification, you know. Um, and in that sense, also, the laws progressed, I think, at a, at a rate far quicker than, than, than where society was at, you know. Um, and that's what we kind of kind of keep dealing with like the challenges around. Another question from the audience. Yep. Uh, thank you for these great conversation. Uh, I will read my question so you can understand me better. Uh, I was thinking about the temporality and the geographical scope that are covered in the archives, both in South Africa and in Norway. Because when we talk about a national archive, we tend to think of past events uh, of history and also about events that occur in the country um, where the archive is located. So I was wondering if your archives are also keeping record of contemporary events, like collecting documents regarding recent events. And second, regarding the geographical scope, I was wondering if both archives include in each collection documents of queer history from other countries. Um, yeah. So. Uh, I mean, part of the joy of being at the Gala Archive is that we're constantly collecting every pride march that happens, particularly student pride or, or like, you know, prides that happen in different communities. Our objective is to always ensure that, the, that there's some kind of historical attachment to that. And so we're continuously growing in the archive. Um, we also see particularly important to develop the contemporary archive. So, for example, like oral history projects, which I think you can also mention, like the Mozambique project, for example, was a whole new collection that was created, which focuses on the history, but also focuses on the contemporary life of, of kind of you know what it what it means to be Mozambican and, and queer and what that looks like now. So so we 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 see we see that as, as very much a part of the the, the archive, the, as we said, the, the historical but also contemporary archive. I'm mean, sorry, there was what was the second part of the question? Uh, it was about the geographical scope. Like yes, it. yes. Um, that's also particularly important in the in, in the African context. So um, Gala houses a collection um, which belongs to the gays and lesbians of Zimbabwe, uh, GALS, which is an organization based in Zimbabwe. And that um, their uh, institutional documents came to South Africa at the time when the Mugabe regime was, um, uh, you know, there, there was a threat of them losing all of that because they were, um, the government was really clamping down. And we knew that that would be really important to, to kind of safeguard those documents. And so that collection now uh, continues to belong with the Gala archive. We, 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 we see ourselves as just safeguarding and holding it on behalf of, of GALS. Um, and we're doing a lot more work in kind of working with other or grassroots organizations or human rights organizations and ensuring that we're supporting them in, 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 in archiving their own um, legacies or institutional legacies within the, the, those countries. We think that's a very important exercise. Yeah. Um, 
I'll start and then you follow. Uh, I think the Norwegian archive is not as uh, broad, broad minded <laughs> as the Gala archive. Uh, I think we have decided to focus mostly on documenting Norwegian queer history. Uh, but that, of course, also includes material from travels, from international context, from uh, a collection of, of uh, gay folk cowboy fiction, uh, for example, uh, from the US. So, so, so far, the queer archive in Norway has been able to accept any donation that anyone wants to donate. So, of course, it includes all kinds of, of international material as well. Uh, but the focus has been on collecting Norwegian traces of Norwegian queer history. Um, and then, of course, on the research side, we have a, a lot of international cooperation and, and specifically Nordic cooperation because the five Nordic countries have such similar histories. Um, when it comes to time, uh, I'll let uh, Steve uh, go on, but uh, one of the big issues now, of course, is digital archives. So papers are disappearing mm -hmm. and how to preserve everything that goes on uh, in the digital sphere, because that's so different from the traditional paper archives. So there is done a lot of work now to try to, to think how can we preserve uh, this digital history uh, for, from the organizations, for example. But you can imagine all the personal histories that I agree is the most important part of the, of the archive. I mean, my personal history would be in email and SMS. And I mean, I don't have a stack of love letters, for example, <laughs> but I may might have some electronic. <laughs> but, uh, but, but they will be lost the day I die. So, so you should all start to keep uh, <laughs> and keep all your SMS. <laughs> We have another question from the online audience. Yes, I actually have two. Um, the first one uh, asks, uh, says, um, uh, uh, could you discuss a bit more on, on the issue regarding intersectionality? And, and also they say that uh, uh, in Brazil, where they come from, there is a majority of cis uh, gender white males as representatives. From of the of the LGBT community, I assume. And then there's a question that says the international anti-gender movement and stop CSE campaigns in South Africa are well organized, well funded, and have support from people in power in order to ensure that their agenda is heard. Do you think that the queer archives can play a significant role in society in relation to educational programming and community outreach in order to resist this problematic rhetoric? If so, how are archives uniquely placed in order to challenge these forces that continue to deny the rights of LGBTQI persons? Sure. Um, <laughs> uh, uh, so I think the short answer to the question is that yes, absolutely. Um, but you know, thinking about the, the way in which the Gala Queer Archive operates, and I, I think we you, um, all you mentioned earlier, uh, safe spaces. Our archive is very much community-based and is open to um, students, researchers, scholars, uh, activists. And, 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 and in doing that, where we, we, we constantly are ensuring that the archive is also the center of our programmatic work and the ways in which it engages with young people. And what's really empowering and, and, and amazing for us is when younger people embrace the archive and saying, this is actually part of my history and that is what pride is, for example, you know, which we've seen a lot of, in fact, just recently, uh, Wits University um, held it, uh, a pride um, march in, uh, which is supported by Gala and the Gala Youth Forum. And, and that was very much a part of what the, the whole pride um, festival is about saying, you know, we, we have a history of, of pride happening in, in South Africa in 1990, that was the first one on the continent. And, and here we are, you know, as a result of that, and yet we face challenges, but, you know, that, that history is so important because without queer history, there cannot be any queer pride. So I think that the archive is, is essential to, to making that connection. And it then allows us to also uh, challenge, critically challenge 
pride celebrations as they now uh, exist all around the world saying, yeah, it's important to celebrate, but pride is first and foremost a protest in the struggle and none of us are free until we're all free. So the work uh, you know, continues. And I think that's where archives are really important in, in mobilizing. Anybody want to answer the question about intersectionality? I think intersectionality should be taught more in school um, because in a way we are all intersectional, um, uh, even though it's not as visible and not as oppressed always, you can always become, become part of this community and also this uh, community. Uh, so that aspect, I think, should be for maybe I'm biased now since I'm uh, now newly educated as a teacher, but um, I think we should bring it into school, that perspective that it's not just this minority group, this minority group, this identity, it could all intertwine and how it affects us all. And often uh, the reason why we've seen white cis men uh, speaking is that we are safe. Uh, we often feel safety, uh, both financially, violence that we insert. And some of us are very happy in our safe space that we're like, no, we're here in our safe space. And we speak about a celebration instead of looking, not everyone's safe. Uh, not everyone has this freedom to speak as we do. Uh, so then it's important to choose, to, let's fight for the rest, let's bring them up uh, as well, instead of like, okay, let's shut the door now because now we're going to celebrate in our freedom. Uh, which yeah. some people do, it's like, no, we are here now. <laughs> Oh, no, you also yeah, I think that's a that's a great question, and that is obviously uh, a challenge uh, and, and a challenge in archive uh, work because uh, uh, when you want to document um, activist history, for example, a lot of that uh, the activists have been white cis men uh, in Norway. Uh, when we tried to do the oral history project, then the Queer Archive had more than 200 uh, oral history interviews, uh, video interviews. Uh, uh, the people doing the interviews report back that getting a woman to say yes to be interviewed takes, uh, they have to, to call uh, 10 or 20 women to get one to say, uh, to accept. Uh, to do an oral interview, but while you call a man, uh, most would say, yes, of course, I would love to tell you my story. So it, 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 it's again this thing about minorities, it takes a lot of work to get the representation of. But I've also uh, been arguing that, that that doesn't mean that we should not interview gay cis men, for example. I mean, their history is not recorded either, so it, it's not it's not to exclude <laughs> white cis men, but it's just you have to work really, really, really hard to get the other voices uh, up there. Um, and that is a continuing uh, struggle. And, and I think class is also a big thing that we should probably talk more about. Mm. And language. Mm. Absolutely. Mm. Okay, you have a big few more minutes to talk about it if you want. <laughs> <laughs> um, I think what they're trying to do with the Gala archive is once again, we have to be critical of the archive itself, even though we're very proud of it because yet again, like it's white cis voices that are, that are predominant. Um, but they tell us something important, but then how, so then that's why the contemporary archive is really important. So like the most big project was done in English and in Portuguese, which is our first project that was bilingual, um, trying to do a lot more um, uh, projects or stories and allowing people to share uh, their experiences in indigenous languages or uh, local languages is quite important in ensuring that there's an opportunity to have those translated. Um, I think it's really about thinking uh, the ways in which the archive uh, continues to be a safe space for people to want to share their stories. And in order to, for people to feel comfortable to share their personal stories, you really have to create a system of trust with communities, you know. Um, it's also why during COVID, for example, Dala engaged in relief work because we felt that we couldn't say to our communities, oh, share your stories with us. Um, and yet yeah, people were like starting to like put food on their tables, you know, yes. like that would, that they would be like, that, that just doesn't make sense. And so we had to engage with our communities and support them 
during their like really difficult times so that we continue to to have their trust you know and their back um, which i think was very very important for us mm -hmm. so yeah i think the work of the archive is, is particularly with queer communities because of all the challenges you had in the past is like you really have to embrace your community create these systems of trust long slow work but it is important mm -hmm. Uh, I think also representation in arts and fiction because mm -hmm. uh, it's so uh, it's difficult when people are feeling safe and seen as humans for them to speak but if we are represented and people are represented in fiction it's e it could be easier to also write some of these fiction stories and then, okay I'm I'm seen I'm here in on the stage in film in this novel and then maybe feel more comfortable to also speak your story. So I think artists, uh, filmmakers have a responsibility to actually make sure that minorities, double minorities are seen. So uh, a young kid, a teenager can like feel like I, I exist in this world and my story could also be told. Well, thank you. If there are no other questions, I just want to thank the panelists for a very, very uh, interesting um, discussion. So thank you so much.